I'm Cameron DeVazier. And I'm Mark Howard. And this is Talking Points. We're on the 11th lesson now of our quarter all about managing for the master. And the, this week's title is Managing in Tough Times. And um, I guess tough is a relative term yeah. because what might be great for somebody might be tough for somebody else, but I well, think there's a more objective look that you were kind of implying here. Yeah, as I went through the lesson, uh, it, it more is speaking about the last days coming to the point of no buying and selling. Uh, you know, I thought the lesson would be more on, although we've kind of touched on the idea of trusting God when finances, anytime we're talking about abound. finances, yeah, they're yeah. up and down, but this is really zeroing in on the last days. Okay. And in principles to help God's people to maintain faithfulness. Okay. Well, with that in mind, um, I'm ex I think that we've, like I said, we've already discussed some of this stuff beforehand a little bit, but I know that there's some interesting topics we want to dive in here, so we don't want to waste any of our time with unnecessary preliminaries here. So let's just get started. I'll give a word of prayer, and then you can walk us through our talking points. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to study your word and these themes, especially stewardship and my, uh, management of funds for your cause and glory. Help us to understand the topic at hand this week and help us to see the biblical principles you have in your word and apply them in our lives. For we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, now as I mentioned, I have here in the outline, uh, my description of the intro is, this week's study highlights principles that are essential for remaining faithful in the last days. Okay. Three talking points. Now this, I told uh, in our pre-discussion, we talked about the, the layout of the lesson. Really, the lesson is just, sharing principles. And so a teacher could just say, you know, Sunday's lesson, putting God first. There's one principle. Mm -hmm. Monday's lesson, trust God, not your own resources. Another principle. Tuesday's lesson, time to simplify. There's a question mark, but the point of the lesson is not a question mark. So you're you saying that simplify. this week's lesson is already laid out in a talking point, so you could just take them day by day and that'd be a good point. Yeah, yeah you could do that. And, and you end up with, although when you come to Wednesday, then it's priorities. Well, I kind of personally struggle with how priorities isn't putting God first. So It better be it your priority. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, that's kind of an equivalent. Kind of and then those. Thursday's lesson is when no one can buy or sell. So it's almost like these are the principles leaning into Thursday. So mm. what I came away with is, number one, talking point, put God first. Sunday and Wednesday's lesson. Pretty straightforward. Number two, simplify your life, Tuesday and Friday. And then finally, number three, trust in the Lord, built on Monday and Thursday's lessons. Okay. Well, let's get into that. Put God first. This seems to be one of those, uh, it's one of the themes that somehow every week is one of right. the recurring themes. You know, it's, it's one of those things also where you're like, you know, it's kind of redundant, but for fallen human beings, it's never redundant. Mm. You know what I mean? A reminder like, no, is helpful. I already put God first. I did that a while ago. Um, it is a constant, the enemy like is constantly- Like if the bend of your life is towards right. selfishness, you have to be In fact, yeah. that priorities lesson mm -hmm. kind of implies that, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Okay, okay. all right, I'm looking forward to that. Well, let's start with that first and put God yeah, first. So, okay. so the lesson uh, points to the attack of Ammon, Moab, and Edom upon Jehoshaphat as an example of putting God first. Okay. And it's interesting in the story of Jehoshaphat in chapter 19, actually, the lesson doesn't bring up 19, it starts in 20. Is you talking about Second Chronicles? I'm sorry, did, what did I say? Yes, you, did say, you just said it just yeah, chapter Yeah, 2 Chronicles yeah. chapter 20. Okay. And of course, the story is Jehoshaphat going out with the Israelites, uh, with Judah rather, and singing yeah, to war praises with to the song, Lord, yeah. right, and, and gaining the victory that way. Okay. What's interesting about that story is if you go back to chapter 19, Jehoshaphat actually, actually had his, his some, some faithful qualities, but he had not been faithful overall, and the Lord sends mm. a prophet to him to say, look, because you have some good qualities, um, you know, I, I, I'm, in, I'm, I'm calling you now to clean things up a little bit. And so mm -hmm. chapter 19 is actually a, uh, a reform in mm. Judah, and it's Jehoshaphat putting things first among Judah, mm. the people of Judah, right? And then that leads into the battle in chapter 20, where what I think interesting there is as Jehoshaphat doesn't know what to do and he cries out to the Lord, the Lord actually once again uses a prophet and sends direction to him. Jehaziel uh, gives him direction as to when you go to battle, don't fight because it's mm. not your... And you have to figure, I mean, seriously, we're going against three warlike nations, but you know what we're going to do? And it doesn't spell out, the prophet doesn't spell it out. Yeah. As far as you're going to be singing, he just says you're not going to fight. 
But the idea of, of singing into battle yeah. does not sound like a wise, necessarily well, I, you wise know, You move. think of like, as terrifying as it would be to go into battle, yeah. it'd be more terrifying to go into battle unarmed. Be like, march out right. with no weapon in hand and just the song on your heart, you know? And am I making about the song and the right. voice too? Just go ahead and sing it out. And he does. And, and, and of course, he follows that explicit direction of the Lord and it brings victory. Mm. And so I, I think what's interesting in the context of stewardship is a lot of times returning a tenth of our income to the Lord plus offerings really makes no financial sense to give away in order to be solid, secure mm -hmm. financially. Yet putting God first in following the explicit direction of the Lord, and, and I want to be clear, that's one of the things I made a point of in the notes. We talk a lot about putting God first. Any Christian's like, oh, yeah, I put the Lord first. And you say, do you do what the Bible says? Here? Well, I'm not sure if that applies to us today. Like, <laughs> if you're not following what God says, that's not putting him first. Mm. That's putting you first. Or yeah. whoever else your guru is is telling you what and to do. painting over with it with, the, with the word of God, like the that's name right. God or something like that. But it's not really God. So the example it's, it's... we see that's so powerful in Jehoshaphat's story is... As crazy as the council may have seemed, he followed it to the letter. And mm -hmm. of course, if you'll read Second Chronicles twenty twenty, I mean, this is a very well-known passage, but this kind of is the summary advice that I think applies to us equally today. So they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And let's be clear that the believing meant doing. follow the instructions <laughs> they give you, and in doing so, they gained victory that seemed to be impossible in an impossible way. Mm -hmm. And so, if we're going to be faithful in the last days and manage in tough times, especially the tough times coming ahead in the last days, mm -hmm. We need to put God first. We need to put his counsel first. We need to follow what he says. We need to follow what he says without questioning. Yes. And the Lord will, will provide for us. Um, so as I mentioned, the lesson later on in uh, Wednesday's lesson, it talks about priorities. Now, it's interesting that we've, we, we've had a week of prayer here, and a week of prayer speaker brought up an interesting point with priorities. Yes. Yeah, he mentioned how priorities, even as a word, is a relatively new word, when you plural it. Because yes. the root of priorities is priority, which the very nature of the concept of a priority is it is your top interest. Right. It's your first. You can't you have know. priorities. Now, he, and, right. and, and he made the point that, and I haven't searched to study this out, mm -hmm. but that prior to the 1950s, you didn't have the word priorities. Right. You know, it comes from a French root, which comes from a Latin word. Right. But it's. It means what's first. Yeah, that condition and you can only of have, being first. Right. And you can only have one first. Right. Right. And so you so can have all our have first a... place winners. Right. Like, no, just one. And so one of the challenges is when we're talking about, for example, putting God first. Now, we prioritize. I don't want to overdo right. it. We prioritize things in our lives. But the thing is, there can only be one thing at the top of the list. And especially when it comes to God and the cause of God and, and God himself putting God first, he can't be one of many priorities. Right. He has to be the priority. And I don't think there's a problem with having the concept of priorities that you have a, a right. triage list, a hierarchy, right? Mm -hmm. But the problem can be, it's like, it's easy to say like, God is one of, he's on my top priorities list. Well, that doesn't mean he's still the top, right? right. And so it, it can be easy to blur it out. And all of a sudden I crept up into number one and still gives the patina of faithfulness to God. That's so, right. That's just a danger. Well, one of the main passages brought up on that lesson on Wednesday is Matthew 6, 24. And so, well, why don't you read that? Or I'll okay. read it. Well, Whoever let's just see who gets, gets there. there first. Oh. Whoever gets there first, say amen. 6, 24. <laughs> All right. Well, you, know, you blocked my Bible. Exactly. Now. Whoever's going to get the... No. <laughs> I have it here. I just happen to have it. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 says, No one can serve two masters. For he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So even with that idea we're talking about, and the lesson is bringing up this in, in terms of priorities, mm -hmm. Jesus said you can only have one. Well, and his implication here is 
it's almost there's no such thing as masters. Right. You cannot serve two. There's right. only one that's the actual master. Everybody else is interested, but there's that's one. That's right. That's so I folded this into my talking point, put God first. And I think what's, what's also interesting in this passage that it really never impacted me as much as going through it this time is because so, we're so familiar with this passage. You can't serve two masters. But it's interesting that Jesus doesn't say you can't serve two masters. You can't serve God and Satan. You know, that's what mm. you would expect. Sure. Like, Those what's the, the antithesis? What ones, yeah. It's either God or money. And of course, in the context, he's talking. But the point is, this, this gives us an insight into how much of a pull mm. riches has upon us. And I imagine it's not just the cash itself, but what it can buy. The, yeah, the, cash, wealth, the influence. The, the, the worldly stuff, right? Yeah. So the lesson goes there into 1 John 2 and, and, the, and the, the, the root sins, the lust mm -hmm. of the flesh, lust mm -hmm. of the eyes, and pride of life. And I'm not getting into that right now. You might in your class. But the idea in the context is just what you're saying. How do those all tie into that desire for it, not just money, but wealth and influence and everything that comes with mm -hmm. it? So... God needs to be our priority. Well, on Wednesday's uh, lesson on the third yeah. paragraph there, it has a great comment. It says, notice Jesus didn't say that it was hard to serve God and money or that you needed to be careful in how you serve both. He said instead that it couldn't be done, period. This thought should put a bit of fear and trembling in our souls. Absolutely. Yeah, so there isn't a, he's not talking about a, a compromise and a balance between them. He's saying one is top and the other must be secondary. Period. That's right. And so again, we're not saying you can't have money, but it's talking about serving. And it, honestly, it's interesting how many, for example, I've shared uh, the truth of the Sabbath with people and they see it. Mm. It's there in the Bible. It's clear. It's the words of the Lord. The Lord says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And their one hang up is, but if I follow that, I'm going to lose my job. You know, what, what is in, and, and at the root of that, I mean, for many people, I've encountered people that they know they can get a job, but I may not get as good a job as that job was. Mm. And that's just one little example of how we serve money. Mm -hmm. So you can have money, but this is talking about serving. And when money becomes your priority, and we were talking about it earlier, like how many times do you talk to a young person who's in college, say, what's your degree? What's your major? Oh, it's in this. Why did you choose that major? I need to make a lot of money. Sometimes it's... Well, they might even say that. They might just say, I, I, I want to get a good job. Right. I want to make sure there's security and stability, which none of those things are inherently bad. But if it comes to the Lord has called you to be something else, well, and you say, I can't because of this, you know, where's your priority? Right. I, I, did a, I, I, I did a class for some academy students um, mm -hmm. a little while back, and I, and I asked that question. I said, you know, what's your priority in life? Top three priorities. You know, nice home. I want to get married and I want to have a good job. So I pushed him. I said, what does a good job mean? And when you get down to it, what good? <laughs> across the board, it's not, it's not like, I just want something that's fulfilling. I mm -hmm. want something that helps people. I want, no, it's got to make money. It's got to make money. It's mm -hmm. got to make money. And I, I, I'm going to say it, that unfortunately that is instilled by a lot of parents. Come on now. It's like, no, 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 you've got to have this job because you get mm. now as a parent, we want the best for our kids, but is having a whole lot of money the best? Well, we'll get into that. That's yeah. it. But the idea is not, again, having money, but serving money. And it's sometimes hard to have mm. a lot and not get into serving it. Fair enough. Fair enough. So put God first is the first step. And, and actually that will roll into, we'll make a more of a point on that in a minute, because uh, number two talking point is simplify your life. Now, the lesson on Tuesday brings out Second Peter chapter 3 versus, uh, well, let's not read the whole passage, no, no, but no. if you want to zero in there right around verse 10. Sure. Because um, after it talks about how the Lord has no will that anyone should perish, right? right. But it contrasts that in verse 10 saying, but the day of the Lord will come. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, go ahead. As the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens and the earth will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Now, here's the key. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. And he goes on to say, since all these things will be dissolved, the right. implication is when the Lord comes, he's not just removing people, modifying the earth and giving us their stuff back a little improved. That's it's right. going to be completely dissolved, wiped away, burned up with fire. So nothing here lasts. Right. And we have the old saying, you can't take it with you. And I mean, mm -hmm. very specifically, and lit you know, we talk, well, when you die, no, even if you didn't die and you were translated with it, mm -hmm. you're, you're not taking your stuff to yeah. heaven. And so with that in mind, that means that all of our money, all of our possessions, any wealth that we have... The only good it it's is, only good now. is here yeah. on this earth. Mm -hmm. And so 
with that in mind, we should be putting it to use here in this earth, mm. which, which in, in many ways we'll be simplifying, reducing it. And I guess what I mean by that, there's a great statement from early writings. I have included part of the statement. I would encourage you to read the whole section. It's actually entitled, Duty in View of the Time of Trouble. Okay, so very that's what we're talking counsel, about, yeah. and it's talking about financial duty. And if you'll read this little piece here. Sure. She said, I heard some mourn like this. The cause of God was languishing. God's people were starving for the truth, and we made no effort to supply the lack. Now our property is useless. Oh, that we had let it go and laid up treasure in heaven. I saw that a sacrifice did not increase, but it decreased and was consumed. So pause there for a minute. So first she hears the cry of these people saying, all my stuff can't do any good anymore. Yeah, we missed the which opportunity. Is, which yeah. is, I mean, what an, anyway. And then this little sentence, like, I saw that a sacrifice did not increase, but decreased and was consumed. Now you think of the animal sacrifices. Mm -hmm. When you would offer an animal sacrifice, you burn it up. Yeah. And so it's, there's nothing left afterwards. Mm -hmm. And so she's, she's looking at that literal aspect and then applying it to that material aspect of things and mm -hmm. saying, you know, if, if a sacrifice consumes away, then our material possessions shouldn't be growing and growing and growing, mm -hmm. and we're building bigger barns, right? Right. But should be reducing. Well, she goes on, I also saw that God had not required all of his people to dispose of their property at the same time. But if they desire to be taught, he would teach them in the time of need when to sell and how much to sell. Now, I mean, there's a whole line of thing we can get into, the country living and moving to the hills and selling your possessions, but clearly, I, I take away from this that, A, the Lord's not going to ask the same thing of everyone at the same time, but he's going to ask something of everyone at some time. That's right. And so the attitude is the key. Am I willing to, am I, it's I so tied to this that the Lord said it's time to sell or it's time to move that I couldn't do it because I'm so, you know, I'm, I'm serving the wrong master. Well, that's what I was going to say. One of the things here that's interesting is it's assumed that those living to the end of time are going to end up selling off their stuff. Yeah. Like, it's just, it's not like, in case, but it's also made clear, you know, it, and sometimes we hear that and we get in that mindset. It's like, yep, it's time, everybody. And uh, you hear certain people yeah. from the pulpit saying, okay, it's time, we've got to start. But you also have a very clear um, indication here that God is not going to call for this mass, everybody at once, giving everything away. Mm -hmm. It's as the cause, cause needs it. Right. And so, and furthermore, that if, God's people said, hey, I, I just want to be in tune with the Lord, and I want to know, if you ask him, he'll reveal. Well, you know, we talked about this. If they desire to be taught, it says he would teach them. But in the further statement, she says, if they didn't ask, he would not reveal when to get rid of the thing. Well, I'm thinking of like in Jesus' call to his disciples, his first disciples, he just said, come follow me, didn't mention anything. That's but right. they just immediately left. They just said, "This, I got to cash right. out and go. Others, like the, the heart of the rich young ruler, he told them, you yeah. got to sell everything. He couldn't do it. But mm -hmm. you look at Nicodemus. When there was a time when he saw the cause, he's like, you know what? I need to give now. And the Lord right. moved on his heart to give and he gave. So eventually people give, you know, if you're following God, you're going to give to the cause, but that's how right. much and when, that's up to the Lord. That's exactly right. Anyway. But the, the idea there, the principle there is then if, if our goods are only of use in this world and we believe Jesus is coming soon, there's going to be a simplifying of our lives. Amen. You know, we're not going to be amassing possessions. Furthermore, retaining an abundance of possessions has a corrupting influence on our spiritual lives. Now, that's lives. an interesting concept because you're like, well, the Lord hasn't called me to give everything yet. So I guess right. it's, but there could even be a danger. There. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, on this one, now I've included James chapter 5, which the lesson didn't bring out, but these verses in James 5, in fact, I'll start in verse 1, 1 through 3. Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted. Your mar garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded. So this is talking about the, the money the, mm -hmm. and the means. The and the stuff. And the stuff has become corroded or corrupted and whatever. Useless, yeah. But it goes on to say, And their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. So... This is talking about the result of amassing riches on the heart. Mm -hmm. And you were making the comment like the, the heaping up treasure yeah, it's, versus... It's really an interesting juxtaposition because you, Christ repeatedly and pleaded with people to lay up treasure in heaven. Right. And here these people have laid up treasure in the end time. So they've put their money in the wrong place. And right. it is now useless, is corroded, and now your influence, your own flesh is 
basically is useless as the thing itself. Yes. We're in treasure in heaven. You're secure. Your money can go to a good cause. It's it's a blessing all around. It's just fascinating. Absolutely. And it, it's interesting. The lesson on Friday makes a really good point because it's funny how we, we, talk, we were talking about how we like to talk about the rich people. You notice that for most people, the rich people is anybody but me. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't matter if I make more money and more money and more, and more stuff and what are the, I'm still not the rich people. Right. And so the lesson points out that even for those who aren't the millionaires, and I'm picking <laughs> up here on Friday, it says we're talking instead about even the middle class people who amid smartphones, IMAX, air conditioning, and SUVs are fooled enough to think that because they are just middle class, they are not in danger of being spiritually pickled by their own prosperity. That's and I just thought, that, what a great phrase. You're just, you're so soaked in it that you become insensitive and and tied to the world and i know inflation has got me thinking like even the term millionaire like it, even when i was younger somebody was a millionaire that was a huge thing but now you have billionaires and multi-billionaires yeah. so that a millionaire and so a millionaire might have the opportunity to say, well i'm not a billionaire i'm not like crazy right. rich but you know how, how how many people in this world would love to be a thousand air or even a yeah. hundred air? It's like, well, I'm not that. <laughs> as long as we're comparing with the next guy up to the thing, it's never me. Yeah. But, you know. But there is a corrupting influence the Bible speaks of. In fact, there's a great statement from Christ Object Lessons if you want to read that yeah. one. Hoarded wealth, she says, is not merely useless. It is a curse. In this life, it is a snare to the soul, drawing the affections away from the heavenly treasure. So it's not just, oh, I have it and I didn't use it for oh, well. good. Yeah. It actually has a corrupting influence. Mm -hmm. Also, Steps to Christ, page 44, and this is on Friday's lesson uh, as well, part of it. In giving ourselves to God, we must necessarily give up all that would separate us from him. Now, there are lots of different things for different people, different idols, but she spells out mammon, is, which has to do with money and riches, You'll see that in a minute. Mammon is the idol of many. The love of money, the desire for wealth, is the golden chain that binds them to Satan, which is mm. just a frightful thought. Like, like, this is something, by hoarding it, or loving the things of the world, mm. everything else in your life can be circumspect. This will take you down. And the danger is a golden chain. It's shiny. It's nice. It's like a padded prison. <laughs> it's so, it's, But it's still a prison. It's still a chain. Right. Yeah. Right, so that leads us into that last talking point, and that is trusting the Lord. Um, Monday's lesson, trust the Lord, not your resources. It talks about the story of David, where David numbered Israel, and the whole idea was he was wanting to uh, do a census so he could get, find the eligible men to draft into the army, increase the army, talk about how big, you know, the nation of Israel had prospered under David. Mm -hmm. And so numbering you could actually do the statistics and say, you know, when I came into the kingdom, it looked like yeah. this, but now it looks like this. And just this. even in the counting itself, people would be blown away. Like, whoa, we, you know, this is really something. But but what, what was happening is David was starting to see his possessions as being the evidence of his his prosperity, the, not the evidence only, the, the cause of, or the, the evidence of his greatness. Or, or maybe it was his own wisdom or something. Yeah. Right. And so... Um, in fact, the lesson says on Monday, paragraph two, note that it was Satan's idea. It says right there in First Chronicles 21, and Satan moved upon David to number Israel. Mm. And the lesson says, note that it was Satan's idea to count the soldiers. He tempted David to trust in his own strength rather than to depend on the providence of God in his defense. Mm. And so the idea is that in a similar way, we can be led to trust in ourselves, our things, our possessions, as long as I have and we were talking about this, like today it's gold. I mean, every, every, at least every conservative commentator is like, don't put your money in the banks, put it in gold, this, that, and the mm. other. Let's be clear. There is no amount of any treasure you have or possession you have that is going to save you in the last days. Mm. The Lord alone is going to do it. Mm. Because the, the lesson goes into Revelation 13, where the day when no one can buy or sell. I mean, even in that day, like I know some, some people in this might be uh, controversial, and if so, email Mark Howard, not me. Yeah, but, right. <laughs> but the idea is like, well, if I get off grid and if I get land far away, that will be my security. But I don't know of any place in Sister White's writings where the purpose of removing yourself is so that so that you're going to be okay in the last right. days. Because everybody's going to have to flee the mountains. We're all going to be fed like Elijah. It's all going to be right. supernatural in the end. So even good yeah. preparation now doesn't mean that, well, my cunning and crafting, I thought yeah. I had, so I'm going to cut my own wood. I'm going to grow yeah. my own food. I'm going to this, that, and the other. It's all going to come down to God in the end, period. Yeah. yeah. The, and, and let me be clear about something. For those living off-grid and storing up your stuff, 
we're told an inspiration. In fact, it may be that same place in early writings that we quoted earlier, that people will find out where the people are who have hoarded stuff, and they will buy it. And I think she used the word they take. They will take it from you by violent hands. Mm. So they target There's you because no, of your preparation. I yeah. mean, the idea of I'm not saying don't make any types of preparations, sure. but trust in the Lord. That's the and, and I have in the notes here. No, no financial ma financial matters at the time when no one can buy or sell. Mm -hmm. Like I don't care what you're trying to give to to buy mm -hmm. with. <laughs> yeah. No one can buy or sell. Financial matters at that time will be entirely out of our hands. No amount of income, inheritance, savings, you know, Bitcoin, whatever else. Mm -hmm. uh, money socked away in a mattress is going to save a single person. So I think the follow-up question is, well, how do we prepare for a crisis like that? Which would be a good question to ask. And the lesson asks it on Thursday. And I have it there. You want to read that? Sure. We prepare now by making sure God's uh, through God's grace, that we are not slaves to our money, to the things of the world. If we are not bound to them now, we won't be when we will. In order to be faithful, have to give them up. Yeah. It's a little bit of a clumsy clunky, sentence, but, but the point is that we should practice not being dependent on them now, so that when the we time comes, on we can just, it'll be seamless. Yeah, Absolutely. And so this kind of concludes with the idea uh, Deuteronomy 14, verses 22 and 23. Now, if you go to Deuteronomy 14, it actually is talking about a special tithe. Sometimes we call it the second tithe and what have you. But the principle is still the same here. Mm -hmm. uh, verse 22 says, You shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. And then in verse 23, it goes on to say that the reason for this is that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. Again, God does not need our money. You know, he uses it in his cause, but the reality is the giving, the idea of the tithing system is to teach us. In fact, the lesson spells this out, I believe, on um, uh, Thursday, the bottom of Thursday's lesson, the tithing system, uh, God established the tithing system to protect us from selfishness and to encourage us to trust him to provide for us. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we're putting the Lord in charge of our finances. We're trusting him with everything. And the lesson goes on to say there on Thursday, at the bottom of Thursday's lesson, um, while being faithful in tithe is certainly not a guarantee that people will stay faithful in the end. You got to maintain a relationship with the Lord. Mm -hmm. You can't just return your tithe and think that's going to do all of it. Yet, it goes on to say, those who are not faithful in tithe are surely setting themselves up for trouble. They've not learned to, to trust the Lord financially, and that, that severe test at the end is a financial test. Mm -hmm. So, in conclusion, Cameron, I've got a statement from Christ Object Lessons 351. Perhaps you can read that for us. Sure. It says, all we possess is the Lord's, and we are accountable to him for the use we make of it. In the use of every penny... It will be seen whether we love God supremely and our neighbor as ourselves. Okay, now but we, we've used this before, at least part of this before, yeah. but it just bears going over it again. And I thought that was interesting because we talk a lot about, you know, ministering to our, our, in fact, I think that's the next one. Our neighbors as ourselves, you just read that. In mm -hmm. the use of every penny. Oh, what matters is we serve our neighbors. What matters is we meet the needs of people. Not giving, yeah. not returning a faithful tithe. No, in every penny you're showing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Putting yeah, your money where your mouth well, is. It's just like, I love the Lord's premium neighbors myself. It's like, what are you giving to either one of them? Well, I mean, not really giving. It's just <laughs> right. more a sentiment. Well, anyway, money has great value because it can do great good. In the hands of God's children, it is food for the hungry, drink for the thirsty, and clothing for the naked. It is a defense for the oppressed and a means of help to the sick. But money is of no more value than sand, only as it is put to use in providing for the necessities of life in blessing others and advancing the cause of Christ. Mm. Mm. Well, I think those are, I love that last sentence there because it outlines, here's the three things yeah. your money's supposed to do. Help with the necessity of life, bless others, and advance the cause of Christ. And it can only do it here. Amen. So. Well, I think there's a fantastic lesson and I'm sure there'll be great conversations in every local Sabbath school. And as we close today, let's give ourselves the Lord in prayer. Mm. Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for this lesson outline that we've just covered. And thank you for the truth that it conveys from your word about the proper sphere of money in our lives and the priority singular that God should have for each one of us. Help us, Lord, to not only have that as a sentiment or, or statement, but help it to be reality in our own lives, that we may put you first in all things, and then with whatever we have remaining, we can honor you, further your cause, and be a reflection of Christ's character in this world. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.